Hey guys, here we are with Homecoming Part 2, and I emphasize that only because they restart Chapter 1. The chapters don't continue, so I'm just going to list Part 2 and then the chapter numbers in the playlist so you guys won't get confused. But anyway, here we go. Part 2, Chapter 1. The motor rumbled like hunger in the belly of the bus. The fumes that floated in through the open windows were swollen with heat. They were on their way. Again. Dicey leaned back in her seat and tried to make herself relax. They had until evening when Cousin Eunice got home. Unless the camps wondered why all the Tillermans were absent and called Cousin Eunice at work, she didn't think that was likely. James leaned toward Dicey. They were the only people sitting in the back of the bus. Nobody would hear them over the sound of the motor. It's like a prison break, isn't it? Dicey knew what he meant. Even so, that's not fair, she said. Cousin Eunice wasn't a jailer. James shrugged. What do you think? He asked out of the corner of his mouth. I think if we can get to New York without being caught, we'll be home free. Home, Dicey thought. She remembered the inscription on the tombstone. Home is the sailor. Home is the hunter. Until she died, Dicey wouldn't expect any place to be home. Home was with Mama, and Mama was in a hospital where the doctor said she'd always stay. There could be no home for the Tillermans. Home free. Dicey would settle for a place to stay. Stay free. Cousin Eunice's house wasn't free. It was expensive. The price was always remembering to be grateful, and there was danger to Sammy and Maybeth of being sent to foster homes or special school, danger to Dicey and James of forgetting and saying what they thought before, wondering if it would sound ungrateful. At Cousin Eunice's house, they were kept busy so they wouldn't be a bother, couldn't get in trouble. Dicey had lowered her sights. She no longer hoped for a home. Now she only wanted a place where the Tillermans could be themselves and do what was good for them. Home was out of the question. Stay might be possible, if this grandmother could be persuaded. Dicey stopped thinking. She wanted to keep it simple. Get to Crisfield and see. That was her plan. That was all of it. Anyway, they know where we're going, Dicey told James. How could they know that? I said so in the note I left. Dicey, why'd you do that? I didn't think it would be fair to leave her to worry. She'll worry anyway. She likes worrying. I couldn't help that, James. I can't help what she's like. I can help what I'm like. You've ruined it, James went on. We can't be running away if they know where we're going. We're not running away. We were never running away, Dicey said. We're just going to see. James shook his head. I'm running away. Before, we were always the ones who were run away from. This time, I want us to do it. What's your plan? Dicey didn't answer. The road flowed under the wheels. They were back on Route 1. Maybe it was her doom, always to get back on Route 1. She squeezed Maybeth's fingers. Maybeth? What's the matter? Are you scared? Maybeth looked at Dicey and nodded. So am I a little, Dicey said. We'll just wait and see. That's all we can do. I don't want to go back, Maybeth spoke in a, sm spoke in a small voice. I thought you liked it, Dicey said. The church, the pretty dress you wore there, all the attention. I did, Maybeth said. Dicey decided to tell the truth now. We might have to go back. Do you know that? Maybeth nodded. Well, Dicey thought. She had underestimated Maybeth. She'd been fooled like the nuns were fooled and Maybeth's teachers. She'd been fooled into thinking Maybeth wasn't who she knew Maybeth was. Look, Maybeth, Dicey said, if we do have to go back, I'll go with you to church and we'll both talk to the nuns, to Sister Berenice. I won't leave you alone so much. Maybeth smiled, a tenuous little smile, and turned back to the window. Smog made the air seem thick, like light yellowed fog. In the heavy traffic, the bus stopped and started, stopped and started. Buildings soared up higher than Dicey could see out the window. She twisted her head down to see their tops. The bus turned onto a new street and headed east. Dicey felt as if they were in a maze and they would never make their way out. Cars honked, lights changed. They traveled down a narrow channel over which other roads crossed on. High bridges. All the, the traffic, all the people, the tall buildings. Dicey felt scared and exhilarated. There was so much life, all here in one place, teeming, whirling about her. More than at the crowded summer beaches in Provincetown. It was like a pot of vegetable soup boiling on a stove, everything moving. A restlessness and excitement came into Dicey with the air she breathed. Anything can happen, she thought. At last, the bus turned off into a huge warehouse. It followed a ramp up and around, then fitted itself into a slot before a wall of glass doors. It became one of a row of buses. The Tillermans stood up. 
Daisy led them to the front of the bus and down the steps, one after another, onto the sidewalk before the doors. Everyone was hurrying. Everyone acted as if he or she knew exactly where to go. What now? Daisy asked James. An information booth, she answered briskly, then bathrooms and maybe something to eat. They entered a huge hollow hall lined with benches and ticket windows. <clears throat> Emptiness hung high over their heads, although the room was crowded with people. The information booth was in the center of this hall. Daisy stationed her family by a water fountain and went up to stand in line. When her turn finally came, she couldn't think straight. The girl behind the glass window spoke without looking at Daisy. Next, little boy, Daisy gulped. When's the next bus to Wilmington, Delaware? Without speaking, the girl handed her a schedule. Where are the bathrooms, Daisy asked. Lower level on the street side. Where can I buy a ticket? Upper level, any window with a yellow or green light. Daisy fled, dragging her suitcase. She thought I was a boy, she said to James. So did Lewis and Edie, he answered. Daisy put the suitcase down and opened the schedule. They had 40 minutes to wait. She would play it safe. Okay, listen, James, take this money, she gave him a $10 bill, and get two tickets for Wilmington. That ticket window over there with the green light. Why not four? Just in case, Dicey answered. Two and two is not the same as four. Dicey looked at her. Not in James looked at her. Not in this case, Dicey said. In this case, it is, but it isn't. You can say so, James said, and I'll do it. And I see what you mean, but you're wrong. Two and two is always four. When they had all four tickets, Stacy started walking along the concourse. She found the escalators leading down. Now we go to the bathroom. The women's room could have held Cousin Eunice's house in it and had room to spare. Lines of women waited before each closed door. Old, young, medium, some alone, some with friends, some with children, one with a tiny baby that rode in a pouch on her chest. The air smelled of perfume and cleanser. Maybeth and Dicey entered the cubicle together because Maybeth didn't want to go in alone. Dicey protested, but you're nine. Maybeth just shook her head. They took turns, Maybeth first. Dicey set the suitcase on the floor and opened it. She took out shorts and a shirt for Maybeth and her shoebox of money. She put 20 more dollars in her pocket. As they left the room, they tossed Maybeth's rolled up dress into the trash. When they emerged from the women's room, Dicey could see, could not see James and Sammy. People hurried past, some carrying suitcases, some shopping bags, some just purses or newspapers. You could get, sorry, you could get lost here in this crowded station. You could get swept away or grabbed by somebody. Maybeth, if we get separated, Maybeth caught Dicey's free hand. Just in case, Dicey said, we'll meet back by that information booth I went to first. Remember it? James and Sammy joined them. They had a hot dog apiece, standing up at a counter, and a glass of orange drink. Dicey looked at a clock, only ten minutes until the bus left. The air hummed with voices, distant motors, and the muffled droning of the loudspeakers announcing what buses were leaving for what cities. If they could get on the bus all right and out of the city, then they were on their way, and they might make it. James and Sammy were onto the bus first. Dicey dawdled by the gate, with Maybeth beside her. Maybeth went first up into the bus. Dicey followed, pulling their two tickets out of her pocket and handing them to the driver. He looked at her with a grimace. What is this, kid's day out? Dicey tried to look as if she didn't know what he was talking about. Never mind, but I'll tell you what I told them. We've got a long drive and I don't stand any horsing around. We won't, she said. I know, I know, your little angels from heaven. Go on back. After a few minutes, the driver closed the door and turned on the engine. He backed out of the parking lot. With every turn of the wheel, Dicey felt her stomach loosen and her muscles relax. By the time the bus entered a tunnel, a smile was beginning to turn up the corners of her mouth. She felt her back relaxing into the back of the seat. Beside her, Maybeth hummed softly. The bus zoomed out of the tunnel and into the light. Dicey stretched, smiled, yawned, and fell asleep. When Dicey opened her eyes, she saw the sleek, straight lines of the rectangular interior of the bus. Out the windows on both sides lay farmlands. Fields of corn ripened under a bright sun. The corn swayed in the wind like dancers with scarves. Dicey wasn't tired anymore. She was relaxed inside and out. She felt lazy and unworried. The bus rolled along. It was as if during that nap, Dicey had traveled days away from Cousin Eunice's house in Bridgeport. That time now felt like a distant memory, something so far behind them that they didn't even have to concern themselves with it. Not anymore. She looked past Maybeth's head out the window. Fields, farmhouses, trees, skies with cloud, sky with clouds, her 
Her eyes roam lazily over them all. Her thoughts roam lazily, too, over memories and ideas. She wrote outside of time and space. She thought about Mama, and it seemed to her that she almost understood why all of this happened to them, to the Tillemans, and all this sadness and running away. She thought about the long walk from Pocket to New Haven, and the grandfather who had tipped them two dollars, and Stuart with his blue-gray eyes, then her mind switched to the journey ahead of them, as if the future were roads stretching ahead, twisting and turning. What did it matter where they were going, as long as they were going? Sammy was asleep on James's shoulder. Daisy leaned over to ask softly where they were. James told her that the last stop had been Trenton. Daisy took a map out of her suitcase. She unfolded it halfway to show Wilmington and the Chesapeake Bay. Beneath her, the wheels rumbled on the road. Sammy woke up. He punched James. James hit him back. Daisy quelled them with a glance and instructed them to play, to play odds and evens while she thought. But I'm hungry, Sammy argued. I can't do anything about that, Daisy answered. Why not? Because I'm not a hot dog tree, Daisy said. Why not? Because if I were, then you'd be one too, because you're my brother. Only you'd be a pickle tree, Daisy said, turning back to her map. A pickle tree, Sammy repeated, trying to repress his giggles, not wanting to laugh at Dicey's joke. Dicey studied the map. Just below Wilmington, the Chesapeake Bay drove up like a wedge between two sections of land. The eastern shore of Maryland, where Chrisfield was, was on the land between the bay and the ocean. It looked about 200 miles from Wilmington to Chrisfield, so it might be a lot farther, maybe as much as 30 days of walking. Too far. But there were some cities that must have buses running to them. Salisbury, Cambridge, Easton. They'd already spent too much on bus tickets. Money was always the problem. Daisy wanted to have money left over so they could get back to Bridgeport if they had to. She figured they'd have to walk part of the way anyway, and she wanted to have some tools for camping. A jackknife, one with a can opener on it, a pan of some kind, ponchos for when it rained. She let her mind wander on briefly to other things, to a backpack and bedrolls, to a portable stove. No, those would be silly. But fishing line and hooks would be useful. There was a lot of water around, so there must be fishing. They had another choice. They could go down the western sh shore to Baltimore and, or Annapolis. It would have to be Annapolis because that was near the only bridge over the bay. That would leave them about half of the distance to Crisfield still to cover, maybe two weeks of walking. They would have to get over the bridge if they did that. The map said Toll Bridge. They probably couldn't walk over it. They might hitchhike, but Dicey didn't like that idea. She didn't like being in somebody's car and not being able to run away. Besides, who would pick up four kids? They might have to take another bus. Definitely then, the eastern shore was better. At Wilmington, they would get on a bus going south. How far they went would depend on how much it cost. That was easy enough. She folded up the map and returned it to her suitcase. The bus made its way through Philadelphia and then south through more farmlands, more small cities. After another hour, after a bridge like a section of roller coaster, they came into Wilmington. The Wilmington bus depot was a one-story building, a single room with wooden benches, a lunch counter, lockers where you could store your suitcases, six windows where tickets could be purchased, and at its center, an information booth with a clock on top of it. 3.45. Dicey told James to stay with Maybeth and Sammy by the door. Only one bus stood waiting now that the one they had ridden on had gone on to Baltimore. That bus, she saw by the sign above its front window, was going to Annapolis. Inside, Dicey picked out a schedule from the assortment at the information booth. The first thing she did was see if Crisfield was there. At the bottom of the list of towns, it was. After Salisbury, Eden, and Princess Anne came Crisfield. Her eye went back up to the top of the list, found Wilmington, and traced the buses leaving for the eastern shore. There were several, but most went no further than Cambridge. Only one went down to Crisfield, a morning bus. Then Dicey saw that the last afternoon bus heading south to Cambridge left Wilmington at 2.30. The only bus after that didn't leave until 9 at night. 9. By 9, Cousin Eunice would have been home for almost three hours. By 9, she could call Father Joseph. By 9, they might be able to trace the Tillermans and maybe find them and stop them. She didn't know Dicey had money, did she? She might think the Tillermans were walking, but Dicey couldn't count on that. She couldn't count on anything. She rushed up to the information booth and asked when the bus for Annapolis was leaving. The man put his hand over the microphone and told her, five minutes. Five minutes? How could she think it through in five minutes? 
They see hurried over to a ticket window and bought four tickets to Annapolis. They couldn't just sit around the bus station for five hours. They, uh, sorry, I lost my spot. Um, oh, they couldn't just sit around the bus station for five hours waiting to be recognized. Cousin Eunice would have to do something to find them. She would think it was her responsibility. Daisy joined her family. We missed the last bus until nine. Tonight? We better stay here, James said. No, Daisy said, we can't. We'll go to Annapolis. It's the only bus. But Daisy, do as I say, James. She wasn't thinking. She knew that. She wasn't thinking clearly. She hurried her family onto the bus just as the driver was closing the door. They sat at the back. Daisy chewed on her lip. Nobody will expect us to go to Annapolis, James said. It was good luck that we missed that bus. I don't know about that, Daisy said. The bus left Wilmington and headed south. This bus was air-conditioned, and you couldn't open the windows. The windows were smeared with grime, and you couldn't see out. The hour and a half to Baltimore seemed endless. At Baltimore, a lot of dressed-up people got on, commuters. They see guests going home from work. The bus grew crowded. Their circuitous route from Baltimore to Annapolis, where they kept getting on and off the same road to stop at little huts by the road and let off passengers, took another hour and a half. Dicey tried to control her impatience by reminding herself that if they had been walking, it would have taken days and days. This was slow, but it was faster than walking. They'd be walking soon enough. At last, the bus turned into a parking lot before a low bridge, a brick building. The bus driver turned around and called, Annapolis, end of the line. The Tillermans hopped up and joined the few people waiting to get off the bus. Daisy just followed in the direction the majority took, turning left down a sidewalk away from the bus station. Behind her, the sun lowered, so they were walking on their own shadows, heading east. Where are we going? We'll find a place to sit and think, Daisy said. I'm, go I'm looking for a park. They passed a drugstore and a finance company and three banks. They saw bookshops and card stores, clothing stores, and a wine and cheese store. The road they walked along came up to a traffic circle. Cars and trucks whirled around it, circling a church that stood at its center. Daisy led them around the circle. Streets led off, but none promised to go to a park, although one said it went to the hospital. At the top of one street, Dicey looked down and saw blue water with sails on it. She stood, staring. It looked like the painted backdrop to a movie, not like anything real. The long main street went downhill and then fetched up at the water. On the blue water, boats sailed or, mo or motored as if they were in an entirely different world, and it wasn't clear in the bright August sunlight where the water ended and the sky began. They headed down the hill to the water, passing stores and shops and more banks. The street was crowded. Parked cars filled both sides, while moving vehicles crawled bumper to bumper uphill, and the sidewalks were crowded with people. At the foot of the street was another circle, around which cars traveled slowly, with a steady chorus of horns and many near collisions. Across this circle, a quiet finger of water hemmed in by concrete marked the corner of a narrow area where people thronged, eating, talking, sitting, and watching one another. Daisy moved quickly through the milling crowd and along beside the water. They passed boats crowded as closely together as the cars in a parking lot, motorboats, sailboats, and old worn fishing boats. At the waterfront, beyond a huge parking lot jammed with cars, they found a public park. It had no grass, just trees and wooden boxes. The ground was covered by wooden flooring. Benches, however, they were in plenty. The benches right at the water were all full, but one beneath a sparsely leaved young tree was empty. The tillerman sat on that. It's hot, James said. His face was red. Sweat plastered his hair to his neck. The air hung moist and heavy over the park. A slight ripple of breeze came off the water, but that did little to relieve them. Everybody seemed slowed down by heat. Nobody walked briskly. Everybody sauntered. A lot of people were licking ice cream cones. Daisy's mouth watered. What time's it? James asked. Without waiting for an answer, he hopped up and asked the same question of a man moving by, who held his suit jacket over his shoulder. It's 7.30, James reported. Time for supper. How about ice cream cones for supper? Daisy asked. She didn't know just how much money she had in her pocket. Not enough for a real dinner. We passed the hamburger joint, James countered. Ice cream, Sammy said. Hamburgers, James said. Sammy stuck his jaw out. Ice cream's cheaper, Dicey said. Double dip. Can I have seconds, James asked. We'll see how hungry you are, Dicey said. James agreed. 
But first I've got to figure out a couple of things, okay? Like what? James asked. Like where to sleep and how to find an Army Navy surplus store and how to get across the bay. Get across the bay? Why? Daisy pulled out the map again and showed him where they were. Then she pointed out Crisfield. Oh, Dicey, why are we on this side? I told you we missed the last bus. Yeah, but... James caught a glimpse of Dicey's face and stopped speaking. I know, I know, but if we can just get across, we'll be much nearer. How can we do that? Okay, we're here. We need a place to sleep tonight, right? I guess. The Army-Navy store will be closed wherever it is. If there is one. I'm sorry, James, Dicey said. I panicked. When I found out we'd missed the last bus... It's okay, Dicey. I just thought you had it all planned. I did, for me to go. Are you angry at us, Sammy asked. It sounded like the beginning of a quarrel. No. Well, yes, a little, but that doesn't matter. I'd rather be all together. Really, I would. I'm just confused still, because I didn't have any plan for all of us. Can you understand that? Sammy didn't answer. I was going to come back, Sammy, Dicey said to him. He looked at her with the question in his hazel eyes. Really? Really, really and truly. Don't you trust me, Sammy? You said you didn't trust anyone. I didn't mean any of us. I didn't mean you. Would you leave me behind? Or James or Maybeth? No. Well, I wouldn't leave you either. I feel the same way. But you were going to leave us behind, Sammy said stubbornly. Dicey sighed. They rose to find the ice cream store. James got a double dip chocolate nut cone, explaining that nuts and chocolate were both rich and filling. Daisy got a scoop of chocolate and a scoop of butter almond. She noticed a pile of maps of Annapolis on the countertop and took one. Maybeth wanted pink sherbet and green, but Daisy told her to get real ice cream because of the milk. She chose two scoops of strawberry. Sammy asked for strawberry ripple ice cream topped with peanut butter ice cream. Look, Daisy said, listening to his order. He grinned at her. FYI, my husband orders like that. The most random ice creams together. <laughs> They sat at a small table to eat. The ice cream tasted rich and smooth and cold. You could tell that it was made from real cream. It was that rich. Daisy studied her map while her tongue made valleys in the ice cream and then smoothed them out. The cone was crunchy and sweet. There's a college, Daisy said. Let's try that, okay? James had a single scoop cone for seconds, another scoop of chocolate nut. They walked out and onto the crowded sidewalk. What were all these people doing? It seemed like a carnival. The college lay in summer twilight, set back from the road by a long sloping lawn. It was brick and very old. Everything looked old about it, old and tended, like the smooth brick sidewalks, the many-paned windows, the little dome on top of the main building. It had trees, huge tall trees with branches too high for climbing, all about on its lawn. There were plenty of people. Students lay scattered about, reading, watchmen, Wandered around on the brick paths. Families were eating picnic suppers. Children ran everywhere. The Tillerman stood on the sidewalk, separated by a briar hedge from the scene. No good, Dicey said. Too many people. She did not move on, however. It looked so quiet and solid. The air over it was lavender in the evening light and mysterious. She wished. She didn't know what she wished. Resolutely, she turned away. Her map showed... So only something called the Historic District. They had walked through some of it. All the houses crowded up on the sidewalk, close to one another. Daisy moved on. The suitcase weighed heavy on her shoulder muscle and banged against her legs. The map showed the Naval Academy in one direction, closed in by a wall that ran all around it. She turned the other way and led them back toward the first circle that they had seen. She chose the road leading to the hospital, and they walked on past that large building. The houses were bigger here and had front lawns a residential area, a rich residential area. She walked on. She saw one vacant lot that had co no cover to conceal them from the surrounding houses. She walked on. The air grew darker, gray-violet now. The heat did not abate. Sweat ran down her back. She walked on. On her left, she saw a long, narrow stretch of grass in the middle of a kind of courtyard of houses. On both sides of the on both sides of the stretch ran roads, and houses stood facing one another across the grass. At the end of this stretch, with all its many windows dark, stood a house larger than any other on the street. Daisy headed down towards it. They walked down the middle of the grass. There was one broad clump of bushes the little kids could hide in if it came to that. 
When they stood before the large house, Dicey noticed oddly shaped piles. Old radiators had been dropped here, and pipes, and stale shingles from the roof, and even a bathroom sink. They were piled up right by the front porch. Let's go round back, she said quietly. I think it's empty. Looks like somebody's fixing it up. If anybody calls out, don't run. Tell them we're looking for Prince George Street. Tell them we're lost. Don't look guilty. Their feet silent on the unmown grass, they stepped around the side of the house. A sliver pool of water glimmered at the end of the long lawn. The back of the house was as dark as the front, and Dicey breathed easy. She put her suitcase beside one of the overgrown bushes that grew by the screen porch, and they all walked down to the water. A long-fingered willow swept the top of the grass at the water's edge. Two towering pines stood silent guard. On the silver pool, which was part of a river, some sailboats floated. There was a bulkhead at the end of the lawn made out of railroad ties. They sat on that and dangled their feet over the water. Daisy's stomach had butterflies of excitement in it. Remember that first house, she asked James. Yeah, think it's empty? I think so. Let's risk it. No other houses were visible, although patches of light from windows showed through high hedges or trees. It was a private lawn. No fire, Dicey said. A sailboat, its sails down, motored up the river. It made little waves that streaked the silver with black and lapped gently against the bulkheading. Dicey turned to look at the house behind her. Its windows were comfortingly blank. We'll have to be quiet and get out early, she said. Her family watched out over the water with dream-dazed eyes. They nodded. The river was narrow enough to swim easily. Across it, houses looked back at them. D James Dicey smiled. Sammy drummed at the wood with his heels quietly. James lay back and looked up at the sky. Nabeth hummed a tune Dicey half recognized. What song is that? she asked. Stuart's song, Nabeth sang. Oft I sing for my friends, she sang softly, remember? Dicey shook her head. We can't sing, but I sure feel like it, she said. I don't really know why. Yes, you do, James said, but said no more. He was watching the first stars emerge in the gray sky. And Dicey did. They had money and a good place to sleep. She had a mat. They were together alone again, themselves again. The night air was warm, and the willow whispered behind her, and the water whispered before her. Okay, she said, rousing them, rousing herself. Let's go up and get to sleep. Thanks for listening, guys. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And please hit the bell icon if you want to be notified each and every time I upload a new video. Whether it's a story time with Carrie or a haul or a review or just random blogging, vlogging, chit chat, whatever. There's all kinds of stuff on here, although I've been really focusing on the reading lately. But if you peruse my other playlists, you'll see there's a lot of other stuff that I have to offer here on the channel. So I hope you find some things you enjoy. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and I will be back soon with more stuff. Bye, guys.